I love this passage in Luke 16. Uh, a lot of people know that in Luke 15, Jesus tells three parables, a uh, parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. And those three parables are given in answer to the Pharisees, the religious leaders who were criticizing Jesus because he was hanging out with sinners, uh, the wrong people. And, uh, uh, and what a lot of people don't realize is that Luke 16 is a continuation of that same uh, conversation. Uh, so Jesus not only gives those three parables, he gives two more parables, a total of five parables. The first three, lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. The next two, there is a rich man, there is a rich man. And uh, what we find out is that the real problem of the Pharisees, the reason that they didn't properly value people, they just said, oh, they're sinners, they're worthless, they're not worth your time. The reason they didn't properly value people is that they improperly valued money. They loved money way too much. So if we only tell those first three parables without the last two, I think we let ourselves off the hook about our problems with money. Now, I know it's hard to imagine Americans having a problem with money, but boy, this is a time for us to face one of Jesus' most important and liberating messages. And it comes in a parable that people think is super hard to understand, super hard to interpret. I just got to tell you, if you know a little bit of basic information about Palestinian economics, of the uh, first century, I think this parable is absolutely obvious, so easy to understand that it just scares us uh, with its bold and blunt message. Are you ready? It starts with the Romans. You got to remember the backdrop to the entire Gospels is the occupation of, uh, of Israel, Palestine by the Romans. And the Romans would come in as occupiers and they would uh, do two things. They would exploit natural resources, and they would exploit the labor of the people. And uh, they would uh, do this in large part through taxation. They tax people. Now look, I know it's really hard to imagine a world where the rich people get off without paying a lot of taxes, but the poor people have to pay a lot of taxes. I know it's hard to imagine that. Just imagine that it happened back in the Roman era. And it also helps if you know that the rich people lived in the south, in the state of Judea, where the capital city and religious capital, Jerusalem, was. And the poor people, the small farmers, lived in the north, in Galilee. And so what's happening is the Romans are occupying, and they need a lot of wine, wheat, and olive oil from the farmlands of Galilee. And so uh, they, you would think, oh, this is a chance for the small farmers to get rich. Didn't work that way. Uh, what happened is the Romans would tax the small farmers. They couldn't afford to pay their taxes. And then their rich fellow uh, people of their same culture and religion down in Judea would come up and say, oh, have we got a deal for you, small farmers? We will pay your taxes in exchange for the deed to your property. But don't worry, you can live on as tenant farmers on our property. And for the low cost of every year, giving us a percentage of your wheat, your wine, and your olive oil. And then those rich guys from the South, they would sell the wheat for Roman bread. They would sell the uh, wine for Roman banquets and they would sell the olive oil for, I guess, Caesar salad or whatever, big market in Rome. And so the guys in the South, I, I know it's hard to imagine the rich getting richer while the poor get even more pressure on them, but it happened. And so um, if you understand that background, one little added detail. So when those rich guys in the South wanted to get their tribute, their portion of the uh, crops of the farmers up north, they didn't want to have to go. It probably wasn't even safe for them to go because they were so hated by the people who were exploiting them 
they would send mid-level managers to go. Um, they were called stewards or managers. And they were sent to go and say, OK, pay up. We need your 30 barrels of olive oil. We need your you know, 20 measures of wheat or whatever it would be. And so that's the backdrop for this really interesting story. There was a rich man. Now you got the background of what that means. Who had a manager. Now you know what a manager does. And the rich man's mad at the manager because he's squandering his holdings. What does that mean? He's not getting a big enough return on investment. He's not squeezing those farmers hard enough. And so he says, I'm going to fire you. You are not getting me enough out of those farmers up there. And you can just imagine the dialogue, because what do rich people say? Those farmers are lazy. They have no idea what it's like to work out in the hot sun. But they just project all that on, on these poor people. And so they say, he, he says, you aren't getting the return on investment for me. I'm going to fire you. I want you to get the books ready to turn in the books uh, so you're going to be fired. Well, at that moment, this manager, he represents probably a lot of us, kind of the middle class folks who are just trying to get by, right? He's, he's caught in the middle he, he, between the, the rich and the poor. And he says, gosh, you know, I work for this guy all these years, and now he's ready to throw me out, and I have no security. I, I don't want to have to be a ditch digger. I, I, I don't want to have to beg. And when he realizes how expendable he was to that rich guy above him in the economic pyramid, he says, I'm going to switch sides. I'm going to start, I'm going to arrange things so that I'll now have friends among the poor. So he says, hey, how much, uh, he goes up north, he says, hey, uh, how much olive oil did you owe my master? hundred barrels? Hey, we'll make it 80, you know. How much wine did you owe? A couple metric tons? We'll make it 1.2. And so he, he gets some return for the guy, but he does it in a way that gives a break to the poor. Simple way to say what this story is about. It's about not about somebody who is evil and terrible. It's about somebody who saw through the injustice of the economic system and decided to switch sides and work for the poor. Uh, and so Jesus, if, if you doubt that's his message, he says, no, listen. He says, uh, you better learn that money isn't the ultimate measure of all things. You would be way better to use your money on the uh, in service of relationships rather than to use relationships in service of money. Jesus goes on to say, you can't serve two masters. And he uses strong language. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't be brave enough to say what he says next unless he had said it first. He says, you will either hate God and love money or love God and hate money. Now, look, we all have to use money. But if you start taking seriously what Jesus said, you almost feel like every time you take out your wallet, you, you should wash your hands because you can be made dirty by the ways that money causes us to improperly value other things. You know, we have a culture that looks at the oceans and the mountains and the rivers and the soil and doesn't think about their inherent value at all. We only think about how we can convert them or use them to make short-term profit for those people at the top of the economic pyramid. Money has brainwashed us. Money has blinded us. And if you're resisting what I'm saying right now, take that as a sign of how deep the holes, uh, in, in, the hooks in all of us that money actually has. I think the kingdom of God that Jesus proclaimed has an economic system. And the economic system of God invites all of us to lose faith in the system that says, let the rich do whatever they want and let whatever little crumbs can trickle down to the rest of us. No, it says, everybody matters. Put God at the top. 
love God, and everything else will have a new value. You'll see everything else in a new value system. And you'll stop. You'll, you'll come to realize that you're actually totally expendable by all the people who are using you to make money off of the backs of people below you. You're going to see things differently. You're going to be set free. You're going to be liberated if you will love God first and put money in its proper place. Amen.